to ICC Transform Working Life Series. ICC is International Christian Chamber of Commerce. And we have a dream about a people who with our plans and strategies and ideas, that that becomes an outward manifestation of an inward walk of faith, resulting in a glorious release of the kingdom of God in the working place, basically in your life, serving God full time everywhere. The module of this program is about God's yes to the nations and cities. You can say a prophetic future. And today we welcome Rebecca Hansen from Norway and Stephen Briggs from UK. So let us try to understand this about God's calling to nations and, and so on. Are there nations and nations and are there cities and cities? What would you say, Stephen? Absolutely there are nations and nations, cities and cities. We have, uh, you, the Bible could be termed in uh, a tale of two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. Those two cities are found, you've got Genesis 11, you've got Babel, and you've got Jerusalem that comes after, which is the reality of the kingdom of God at work on earth as a prototype of the reality of what it's going to be like in eternity. So you mean we are coming out of uh, Garden of Eden, we're moving towards the uh, New Jerusalem, but in the, in, in the meantime we are sneaking by the Babel. Exactly, so the city of God. Babel means confusion. There's actually, the word Babylon in Scripture is not there. It's Babel, which means confusion, the city of confusion. And that was man's attempt to get to God uh, in their own strength. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem is God's process of getting us to Him. And so you see these two cities that run throughout Scripture. We want to be found in this one was born there, as it says, this one was born in Zion, that one was born in Zion. It's yeah. another name for Jerusalem. But in these days, people say, well, this is, you know, old history. So why is Israel and Jerusalem, as you mentioned, so important for the body of Christ today to dive into and to discuss and to understand? Well, you know, that's a very good question. In Acts 1 verse 6, you have the disciples after spending 40 days with Jesus in the wilderness and in the best Bible school you possibly could be in, yes. they only had one question. Will you restore the kingdom to Israel? No, it wasn't will you restore the kingdom to Israel. It was will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. Those three words are crucial because it identifies that the question of the restoration of Israel wasn't in doubt. The only question they had was a question of timing. In other words, God's plan and purpose to restore Israel and Jerusalem and for it to be part of his plan and purpose of redemption on the earth was ongoing and was going to be fully restored. So the kingdom of God was not a structure of something new. It was something which was inside of us. Having said that, let me then understand what you think about how people traditionally today think about Israel and Jerusalem. Reading all the newspapers, listen to a lot of comments about that this is happening and this is not and so on. Why is this on all front pages? Because it's a spiritual issue principally. It's all about the fact that God has placed his name there in Jerusalem. In Psalm 2 it says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will tell of the decree, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten you. In Psalm 2 we have a, a situation, verse 1, it says, um, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Mashiach, which is Messiah, saying, Come, let us cast away their cords from us and tear their bonds asunder. And then it says in verse 4, He that sits in the heavens will laugh, the Lord will have them in derision. So here we have a declaration of nations, and recognizing that it, there is a nation within the nations that is to be a testimony of God mm. to all the other nations. Mm -hmm. So, let me put it this way. You, Jan, are a testimony of Jesus to your neighbors in Sweden. You can't be a testimony of Jesus to everybody on the earth. Israel, in this day and age, is a testimony that there is a God on the throne to all the other nations. That's why the other nations don't like it, because it reminds them that they have to answer for their actions. Let me go to you, Rebecca, here and, and, and say, what do you think about the uh, next generation that both you and Stephen belongs to uh, when you listen to this conversation? Would you say that this is the take and understanding that your peers around the globe have about Israel and Jerusalem? In general, uh, after my perspective, absolutely no. <laughs> because I, I believe the, the younger generation thinks of Israel like tradition, history, uh, there's a country, the uh, people they are reading about in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't understand uh, what is happening in the Middle East, why mm -hmm. the, the fight, the spiritual fighting that's yeah. going on. Uh, and also that uh, Israel is a clock uh, due to the end time. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's, it's very important to understand the link between Israel and us and now. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, as I said, after my perspective, I don't think we get it, actually. So what do we do then to get uh, these questions and this real global issue, which seems to be a, a center of many discussions about geopolitics and economy and migration and a lot of things, what would you say would be a relevant thing for, for to, 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 to serve the next generation and coming into a, a new understanding or a more, maybe more relevant understanding because a lot of them are looking for the best innovations, the best uh, thoughts for the future, great visions. And uh, we happen to know by fact that Israel is a very good nation. It's like a startup nation. Uh, how, how do you think we can connect the dots? I can just speak from my own experience. For me, it was uh, crucial to understand uh, the history, the dots uh, in the Bible, but also related to what is happening now. Mm -hmm. So when I understood that, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. And I was curious also to dig in and to learn more. So I think the knowledge is actually crucial to, to, to be able to communicate this message mm. in a clearly and understandable way yeah. to this uh, new generation. So if I try to draw, draw a conclusion here, uh, to read newspapers and parallel read the Bible would be a very good thing. And then try to, as you say, un understand and, and match what's going on. Absolutely. And, for, and after my experience also, uh, it uh, makes a lot of sense seeing that uh, Israel was uh, the demonstration people for God and also seeing that uh, after in parallel to my life uh, you know we, we all have uh, you know a promised land in mm. our own life we mm. all we all have to to migrate from Egypt mm -hmm. the slavery uh, in the desert yeah. around yeah. so it's a lot of wisdom here uh, that is really relevant for the modern uh, people today mm. uh, so so it's, it's about a, a lot of different dimension I will say yeah. so let us then uh, ask you Stephen uh, what about the future then? Uh, Israel, the nations and the future. What's the most uh, important things to put on the table? Well, it's, it's a glorious future and we have to recognize that Revelation, I think it's Revelation 7, 9 says that the, uh, the kingdom of God, every tribe, tongue, nation and people are represented. So it's not just about Israel. That's, that's the mistake that people make. It's about Israel and the nations. Mm -hmm. And, and you cannot have the complete picture without Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. That's something that God is going to do. It's going to be miraculous when it happens. You look at the thousands of years of history where the enmity has been between Jew and Gentile, and yet we're going to see something that's quite profound. In, and that's already beginning to happen in the marketplace. We're seeing Jewish businessmen, Christian businessmen coming together mm. and, and engaging with each other on every level in, if you like, a, a spiritual chamber of commerce. Mm. So let me add to that, uh, we as ICC have a vision about connecting the dots between Christians around the globe with the Jewish people to do business because I think as you said, it's, there's a bright future. And the question is how do we really come into different processes on all generations, all sectors, all industries, all kind of, of, of things and, 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 and thoughts. But let me ask you finally, uh, we have something called the, the replacement theology that the church uh, the Christians has replaced everything what's said about Israel. That's what, as Rebecca said, yeah, we look upon it as history. Mm -hmm. So what do we really say to be relevant in our days, thinking about if, uh, in an interesting future together? Well, Romans 11 verse 25 talks about a mystery. It says, for I would not, brothers, have you ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits so that a hardening in part has befallen Israel until the full number of the Gentiles become in and so all Israel shall be saved. Now that's very, very interesting because firstly it describes it as a mystery. In other words, Israel is a mystery. Uh, and then it just says that Paul addresses brothers. So he states that there are brothers who understand the mystery of Israel. So he's talking to believers. Mm. But he says, I wouldn't, brothers, have you ignorance of this mystery. In other words, there are people who are ignorant of the mystery of Israel, replacement theology, those who don't believe there's any yeah. purpose in it. And the third position is those who by the grace of God through revelation have an understanding of the mystery of Israel. Three positions, those who understand, who are brothers, those who are ignorant, and those who are arrogant, and yet they're all called brothers. Now within Romans 11 verse 15, it has an amazing promise. It says, if the casting away of them, that is the Jewish people, was the reconciling of the world, that's the Gentiles, you and I, yeah. what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Mm. The word that's used there for life from the dead is the same word that is used for Jesus rising from the dead. Mm. So the consequences of this reality of experience of knowing uh, Messiah is something that's going to have the same consequences mm. 
2,000 years down the road in the sense that you and I are sitting here today yeah. having received as something that action that took place 2,000 yeah. years ago. So would you say, Rebecca, there's an opportunity to bring uh, young entrepreneurs uh, to understand more, to see the, to, to, to smell and taste and see what kind of innovations Israel are actually producing today as a starter to getting a deeper revelation and understanding of these brothers in the future and sisters. What do you think? Absolutely. And, and for me, I, I'm visiting Israel for the first time uh, at our IGM in November. Mm -hmm. And that really touched me uh, because then I, I, I understood more and when I was there. Yeah. And, and so absolutely, yes. Mm. This is great to hear. Thank you so much. And now we have uh, tried to uh, uncover uh, the issue of uh, the nations and Israel. And if you stay with us, we will go in to discuss important societal values. Welcome back to ICC Transform Working Life series. And we are dealing with today God's yes to the nations, cities, and big important societal issues. We have now invited uh, Mr. Gerhard Rau from uh, Germany uh, to speak to us. And, and the question is, if we now think about three areas to deal with, it will be talk about uh, technology, values, and environment. And let's start with uh, technology. What would, what would you say uh, there is coming out from the Bible? Is, I mean, the question is, does God, God has something to say about technology? I would, I would say absolutely yes, because I'm convinced technology was actually given right at the time when God created heaven and heaven and earth. Technology was given as a potential, uh, the creativity of, to be discovered by the creativity of mankind and uh, also as a potential uh, looking at the resources uh, give, uh, given to the earth. Mm -hmm. And so I'm convinced technology is neither good or bad, but God's intention is that mankind would discover it in relationship with him, discover the potential that he has placed into man and into, uh, into, in, into the nature, discover this potential and apply it to the good of mankind as a blessing, uh, as a blessing to mankind. And this automatically leads us to the question of motivation, intention, and values in the application of technology, mm -hmm. because you can use it in, differ in different directions. It's given as a potential to be discovered with the intention mm -hmm. for good of the mankind. And when we look right at the beginning of the Bible, we actually see technology in application, and let me say, not such a good example, for instance, talking about the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. There was a huge technological progress at that time because for the first time, the Bible says it was possible to burn bricks mm -hmm. compared to dried clay, which offered the unheard opportunity to build much higher than before. So this is kind of a revelation at that time. A new technology is coming. Yes, that was revel this was a potential God had given right at the time of creation, discovered at that time, released, but mm. the application was mm. to reach out to God with our, own, uh, uh, with our own strength and to make a statement to build a tower until, uh, that reaches to heaven. So you said the technology was good, but they did the wrong thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So if we take that experience into today's modern society, 21st century, what does it really mean talking about uh, robots uh, controlled mm. by ice everywhere and digitalization and things like that? What would you say? And I would say this is today even more relevant than it was centuries ago because what we are observing is an unheard release of new technologies, breakthroughs that were even unthinkable a couple of decades ago. Today, for instance, we talk about genetic engineering, which on one side offers the potential to cure certain diseases in a way that was never possible before, mm. and at the same time, genetic engineering offers the potential to create a new type of human being by adding certain abilities, capabilities that were not given to mankind. Mm. And the question is, is this an application of technology that would be a blessing to mankind or not? I doubt. The same is with other areas. Think about uh, smart uh, machines. 
uh, equipped with the capability to take autonomous decisions or smart robots combined with artificial technology which will soon be superior in certain capabilities of memory, of remembering, mm. of know-how, superior to a uh, superior to man. Yeah. And the question once again is how do we how do we use it? Yeah. I am convinced if we leave this technology to the secular humanistic mindset, we will we will soon observe a dramatic increase yeah. of control, a reduction of freedom, a big gains uh, for few at the cost of many mm. and this calls for uh, for this calls for us as Christians uh, to see people that uh, to see that people actually enter in these areas mm. with a solid biblical understanding combined with excellence in these technologies mm. to discern what God actually had in mind it when he placed the potential for genetic engineering into mankind mm. right at the yeah. right at the time of creation and uh, we are inviting uh, people to join hands with us mm. in order to work in these areas discovering what uh, what God's yes for these areas because I'm absolutely convinced none of these is a surprise to God none of these is new to God because they were given right at the beginning of the creation yep. as a potential to mankind and it is our task to develop them in relationship with God to see an unheard release of blessing for mankind through these new technologies, yep. rather the contrary, so which is at risk. So we say yes to technology. God created our, our minds and we can use it. So the question is if we use it for bad or good, and uh, which means AI could be used for good, and uh, everything could be used for good and for bad. So let me ask you, uh, do you think we have a solid, robust discussion today in society and in the body of Christ, in church, including in ICC with our constituencies and collaboration partners, or do we need to gear up for a new type of discussion, uh, which to me would be about figuring out how do we discern between what is good long-term and what is bad long-term, which might be, we can, if I interpret you, we can do things, but maybe we shouldn't do it. So what's your take on where are we in the discussion today in the body of Christ? According to my observation, unfortunately, the body of Christ is silent about these issues or is not even touching them. When you go to church or you listen to Christian programs, they deal with all kinds of issues and all of them have their right and are relevant, yeah. but nobody is touching these technological aspects from a Christian perspective. Mm. What we actually need is something like a Biblical, uh, biblical foundational understanding of technology. Mm. Perhaps you could even say a theology of technology yeah. applied yes. for the uh, for the blessing for the blessing of mankind. And I see the risk that Christians are silent mm -hmm. or are closing their eyes yeah. and leaving these areas to the secular humanistic mindset. And suddenly we wake up to a great surprise. So. Um, we heard in Sunday school, probably both you and I, that Jesus is the answer. And what you are saying now, the question is, what is God's yes to technology? Absolutely. We know that Jesus is the answer, but this foundational understanding now needs to be transferred mm. to new areas of applications. Right. What does the gospel and what mm -hmm. is the ethics and the value, yeah. foundational values of the gospel, mm. what is their meaning yeah. and application when it comes to genetic engineering mm. or when it comes to the application of, you, of uh, uh, artificial yeah. intelligence? Thank you. This is a very good and interesting comment. Let us switch to another uh, uh, topic, uh, and I would say a societal issue. That's values. Values are dramatically changing today. What would be your comment of the key core values which are really, really important for everyone who lives today? Well, what's important first and foremost is the values are foundational. And so we have to look right back at the beginning to where the, the values are found. And one of those values that is instituted right from the very outset is marriage between Adam and Eve. Uh, and it was a blood covenant that took place there and that marriage throughout history has been a blood covenant. There's been the shedding of blood 
between husband and, and, and wife when they come together for the first time. In Ephesians 5, we see, and into Ephesians 6, the start of it, we see not only that relational value between husband and wife, but we also see it between children and parents. We see it between parents, specifically fathers and children. And then we see it where it talks about masters and servants. In other words, employers and employees. And each and every one of those relationships is called out in Ephesians uh, 6 before we enter into warfare in Ephesians 6 where it says the full armor of God that we're all familiar with. And every one of those areas, those right relations, those right values are intrinsic for society to function well. When we remove those from society, when we deem that we want to reconstruct or, 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 or address or change those mm. foundational values, then inevitably it creates the death of a society. So how, how do you think about how can Christians be relevant in this discussion? I think it's vital that we first and foremost take hold of the Word of God. What does the Bible say about the values we hold, our morality, our ethics? There is an application, as we've seen from Gerhard, into technology. Okay, well, if there's an application into technology, then there must be an application in other areas of society's functions and industries. And that's what this series will be all about. It's looking and saying, okay, well, what is God's yes to values? What is God's yes to family? What is God's yes to social care? How do we respond? The James 1, the very last verse, says this is pure and undefiled religion, to look after the widow and the orphan. That is part of a value system that is intrinsic within uh, Christianity. We need to be looking after those within society that are uh, not as well positioned, say, perhaps as we are. Mm. So what you say is there is really a God's yes to all these questions like family, marriage, life, knowledge, creation, and so on. Absolutely. And we can find them in Scripture, we can find interpretations and applications in the daily life. Yeah, well, Scripture says all Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. And so if all Scripture, that, that means 66 books, not 27, it means the whole counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation, we need to take hold of this and say, okay, God, in this situation, I don't know what the solution is, but you are the God who created, mm. and therefore you have the solution. You provided a solution to... Um, to Moses in bringing the tabernacle and creating the yep. tabernacle. You provided a solution to Solomon yep. in build, building one of the greatest yes. uh, buildings that's ever been created. And you can provide a solution to us in our family circumstances, in our business circumstances, and in every sector of society. The Bible is not just relevant for the church, it's relevant for what happens outside of it. So that means what Yegegara said before, uh, the, the, that's the theology of work, that's the theology of, of technology, it's the theology of all these areas which we are dealing with each and every day. So let's say that's the case. Let's then switch, we said, our God's yes to including environment and nature. And if we pick the, the environment as the third uh, important societal issue, what should we then say about what is going on today in the discussion uh, about the, God, the Lord created earth, the Lord created man. So I would ask the two of you to, to, to give a comment on, on what you, how you assess the situation in the discussion about environment and related to the Word of God? Well, firstly, you've got a situation where um, society has sought to remove God from the equation. And uh, reading through the Bible, I would see that actually God is the creator of creation, uh, and, and therefore God is the one who's in control of it. If you create something, you are responsible for it. There's a couple of scriptures that people can look at. We don't have time to unpack them fully, but Isaiah 24 4 to 6 has a comment on this and Psalm 107 verse 33 and 34 and I'll read that to you it says he turns rivers into a wilderness and water springs into a thirsty ground a fruitful land into a salt desert for the wickedness of them that dwell therein so we see a situation in society where they want to say man is at fault for uh, the destruction of creation or the destruction of, of, uh, of life and of the environment which yeah. is a half truth in the sense, it's not the only aspect that needs to be involved in this equation. God says he uses the environment in order to bring attention to what man is doing and to cause them to come into a right relationship with him once again. He's done it historically. He will do it again in the future. Why? How do I know it? Because the Bible says that to be the case. So you mean there is a, a connection between how uh, people behave? and what, uh, how God uses uh, what's happening in environment. And in, in, does that include uh, uh, climate change issues and all those kinds as well? 
I, well, this, the Bible is relevant. Leviticus 25 gives us farming instructions. So if you want to break it down as simply as possible, you can go to farming yeah. and say, oh, well, there's an application. There's, a, there's a, a principle of a day of rest or a year of rest. And actually, it's been proven in science that you need to give an opportunity for land to rest in order for it to restore itself. So what do you say to a pastor who's, who, who preaches a sermon about you should have shame if you fly, you should not eat meat, and you should do different things? Is that... A the on you think on God's agenda for today? I think there's two aspects to it. One is we need to understand that where Scripture speaks, we can uh, r remind people of it. And it, in Scripture, I think it's Timothy, it talks about um, the fact that there is uh, the forbidding of eating meats. And we're in a society now where that is an increasing cultural uh, relevance. It's mm -hmm. something that we will see. It talks about it in the last days. It yep. also talks about an adjustment with regard to marriage in that process. So the Bible, where the Bible speaks about things, we need to sit and take notice. Where it doesn't, we need to seek the Lord and ask what his solution is. A quick comment from you when you hear this discussion about the environment in 30 seconds, what, 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 what's your most key issue? Well, one of the key mandates God has given to mandate was the garden should be cultivated and stewarded. And stewardship means to take well care mm. of the garden. Yep. So when I look at some of the environmental issues, I would say uh, it is a fair statement that Christians with God should actually be the first environmentalists because, again, this introduces the aspect mm -hmm. of, um, of values. Yeah. When creation is used, dominate by greed, then you don't care of the consequences of some of the aspects. Think of certain pollution aspects, for instance, which are severely damaging env environment. Mm -hmm. We should take a position and say, this is not God, good stewardship and make a, a, a proposal how good stewardship would be an example that is actually blessing mm. mankind and by preserving the potential yeah. God has given with creation. So if I try to summarize, you say that the Christians should be even more diligent and good stewards about creation and everything on earth. Plants, I think, animal, and everything. I think we should be an example yeah. to interpret what good stewardship means in relation yeah. to creation, because it is entrusted to us to steward it. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, I would say to you that uh, you have just listened to uh, the ICC Transform Working Life series about God's yes to the nations and cities and societal issues. And we welcome, to welcome you to come back for another topic, another time. God bless you. Take care. Bye for now. To learn more about transforming your working life, including transformed working life training events taking place near you, go to our website, www.transformedworkinglife.org.